All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's been a great week. Yeah, I've really enjoyed the time with you. Enjoyed um, hearing from uh, Mike and Mercer, the ministry that the Lord has given them. And uh, it's been uh, just a very unifying week. It's been great to see the Spirit of God intertwine the ministry in a way that um, really, I think, brings edification to the body. And it's, it's always a joy to see that. Uh, a couple things before we get into the topic of uh, reverence for God in a casual world. Uh, two things. One, uh, I haven't mentioned my website. If, if you're taking notes, it's Henderson Publishing. Sorry, not website, but YouTube channel. Henderson Publishing. There's a link on the YouTube channel that will take you to uh, my website. But if you remember Henderson Publishing, there's videos there. Uh, ministry videos. I also have a playlist for bitter up hiking. Um, Brent and I have developed a gospel track. Uh, wherever we hike, we give out tracks. We put them on windshields of uh, at the trailheads and so forth. And it has a QR code and and it takes people to the website so they can get more information about the hikes. But it also brings them to um, spiritual matters as well. So just a little technique we're using for gospel ministry. So Henderson Publishing. Um, Is that all one word? Yes. Any capital? Any capital? Well, if you uh, if you just uh, go to YouTube and put in Henderson Space Publishing, it'll pull it up. And if you want to subscribe, then you'll, you'll find out anytime there's a new video or something. Uh, the second thing is I want to clarify something I said yesterday. I didn't mean to uh, say too much about John 1. It's Greek construction. But I messed up in explaining that. I was thinking of another passage, and the end result is the same. But as you look at that end of verse uh, 1, John 1, um, the word was God, and the word was God. The JW has added A in that. The word was a God. There's no, um, in that text, there's no, uh, article for God, the article goes, the ho goes with logos, which is word. Um, in Greek, you can put an indefinite article based on the case um, or gender information, but it's quite evident as you read that text, John's not talking about a God, he's talking about the God, okay? The one who created all things. So the JW is add an indirect article in that the word was a God. I kind of messed that up my explanation, and I just wanted to clarify that. Well, could you ask them how many gods they have? Well, you could. Yeah. They also make it a small case to me. Yeah, they would say he's a, the first act of God was to create the Lord, and that's what they confused out of Colossians 1. He's the firstborn of creation. That's not a title of essence. That's a title of authority, uh, position. So, um, the topic I want to visit with you about this morning, I think is kind of like the frosting on the cake of what we've been thinking about this week in a practical application-wise. Um, even in my time, I have seen uh, more and more lack of reverence for the Lord um, even in Christianity, but certainly in the world. And I think that we have a high standard. We've been thinking about who the Lord is, what he's done all week, and um, appreciating him more and more in the great plan of, of God that's unfolding. And so uh, we don't want to uh, say things or address him in any way which would demean him or lower him. We want to keep him exalted. And so I just want to think with you, there's nothing in this that's legalistic, I just want to think with you as we look at the whole of Scripture, how the apostles thought about the Lord Jesus and how they addressed him. And also just kind of look at some of our terminology and speech. Is it, ac is it accurate? Uh, could it actually be demeaning to the Lord? We don't even know that, right? So we want to think through these things, and my pointer's not working, so i got to do this. We read in Psalm 111.9, and this is the KJV, he sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Holy and reverend is his name. Unfortunately, 
Uh, my father was a Baptist pastor and he took on the name Reverend R.B. Shoemaker. Well, that's a name for God. I think that's whenever we take God's name, something scripture says this is his name and start applying it to ourselves, that's dangerous. Holy, hallowed be thy name. Holy is thy name. Now, some of the newer translations will say, awesome is your name. And that's fine. But what do we hear in the world today when people say, oh, man, that's awesome, right? You hear that all the time. Um, you know, that's, that's awesome jerky, you know, whatever. And is there any, any um, verbiage in our language that is left for God? In other words, it seems like we, anything that's spectacular that's really associated with God, we bring it down to our level and we start applying it across the board in and, and earthly things. And um, so one of the things that my heart's been burdened on is can we sanctify, can we set apart some words that Scripture says are for God and just leave them for God instead of bringing them down? Uh, Matthew 6, 9, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, his name, his dwelling place, transcend all that is common and earthly. He is holy and should be revered. And then we've been thinking about the last days. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul, speaking of the, the latter days or the last days, gives us an indication of how men will behave. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Well, do we see that today? Proud, blasphemers. Blaspheming, blaspheming God, degrading his name, demeaning him. Highly esteeming oneself directly brings God low in our minds, and this will be a characteristic trait of the final days of the church age. Man, anytime we exalt ourselves, we're bringing God down. So some questions to ponder. Do we ignorantly show disdain for the Lord's name, by the way, in which we address him or speak to him, to others, does all of our speech and behavior reflect reverence and adoration for the Lord Jesus? So what is in a name? Divine names have importance to God's people, for God, through his names, is revealing himself to us and his relationship to us. I think of Psalm 100, where uh, the Lord talks about being the shepherd of his people. It, it wasn't just that the Lord was the shepherd of his people. He wanted to know the people to know, I am your shepherd. And that was a relationship that he had with them. Cambridge Annotated Study Bible says this, the name of God is a personal disclosure and reveals his relationship with his people. Often this is his covenant people, Israel. His name is known only because he chooses to make it known. Even though he was... Uh, he was mysterious, lofty, unapproachable. He bridged the gap with mankind by revealing his names. All that we know about God is what we know from his word. He's, he's told us about his character, his attributes, and his names uphold his character and attributes. The truth of God's character is focused on his name. God's name reveals his power, authority, holiness. This accounts for great Israel's great reverence for God's name. Um, the Jewish rabbis, if they were reading the text out loud, when they would come to Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, uh, they wouldn't even say the name. They, they would exchange it for Adonai or Elohim or, or something like that. Uh, they had great reverence for, for the name of God. So the third of the Ten Commandments prohibits the violation of God's name. Uh, the first four of the Ten Commandments have to do with our relationship with God. The last six have to do with man. And the third commandment, uh, which we read in Exodus 20, verse 7, and Deuteronomy 5, 11, says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. I found it interesting that um, under U.S. federal law, uh, the name and image of Spokey the Bear is now under the protection of, through an act of Congress in 1952 is brought underneath the Secretary of Agriculture. It is actually against the law to defame Smokey the Bear in the U.S. His name and image are protected under, under law. 
Yet, if we demean the God of heaven, that's called free speech, and that's perfectly allowed. So here we have U.S. law protecting the image, the name of an imaginary bear who's helped fight forest fires for over 70 years, but the eternal God, there's no protection for defaming him and his name. I mean, that's how screwy the world is getting. So, let's think about blasphemy. In the New Testament, the word blasphemy appears both in the noun blasphema, occurs 19 times, and also blasphemo, that's a verb, 35 times. Um, blasphemy, or blasphema, means, it's translated uh, blasphemy, evil speaking, or railing, and it denotes slander or speech injurious to another's good name. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31. We looked at this, I think it was yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, one of the brothers was speaking about um, the unpardonable sin, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. And as it was explained, uh, the Lord Jesus was standing in the presence of these religious Jews. He did a miracle, and they were ascribing the power of that miracle to Beelzebub and to the devil. And it was um, demeaning to the, the Holy Spirit, not only affirming that the Holy Spirit is God, but it was a, a disdaining, demeaning uh, declaration that Pharisees were making against the Holy Spirit. That's blasphemy. And as was said, I don't believe that particular sin can be um, committed today, but in this day it was, and it was indicative of the, the turning away of the nation of Israel at that time from hearing the kingdom gospel message. And blasphemo, when we look at the verb form, it means to defame, rail on, revile, speak evil, especially against God. So, when an individual rails, slanders, or speaks evil against God to cause injury, harm, or offense, that individual has blasphemed God. We can do it with our speech. Uh, there's five or six behaviors we can do in the New Testament that also blaspheme the name of God. Uh, Romans <clears throat> talks about this in chapter 2, where God had given the laws to his people. They were to be a, this testimony to the Gentile nations. Of, of the true God, reflecting him in their character and worship. And because they knew the law and didn't do it, they taught it, but didn't do it, uh, God's name was being blasphemed among the nations. And so we can do the same thing. We say we're Christians, but then we don't act like Christ. We're actually bringing disdain upon uh, the name of Christ. And so stealing, and there's other things in the New Testament that cause disdain upon the name of Christ. Matthew 23, I just want to talk about the two general categories of blasphemy. Matthew 23, 16. Now, this is Super Tuesday. The Lord, he told several parables. Um, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Pharisees, the lawyers, everybody were taking their pop shots at the Lord, trying to trip him up. And then he delivers this woe message to the Pharisees. And one of the things that he says to them, starting in verse 16, is, Woe to you, you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. And he says the same thing, fools and blind. In other words, the Pharisees were saying, you know, if you make a, a pledge to God, a promise to God, and you swear by the temple, yeah, maybe you do it or you don't do it. But if you swear by the gold ban on the temple, then you got to do it. In other words... The Lord is the one who gave the, um, 
the prescription for the tabernacle and the temple, the things that he wanted, the things that were important to him. This was to be the place where God's people would come to worship him. And now they were getting caught up about a gold band on the temple. And, and that was what was important in their life. And so they were taking what was um, earthly and unimportant and giving it an, an elevated status. And so there's two types of blasphemy. One is, is taking earthly things and bringing them up to divine uh, standard or divine um, position or taking what is holy and bringing it down to the earth. Both are insulting to the Lord. Holy and reverent is his name. Taking his name and making it, associating it, aiding something on earth is a form of blasphemy. I have heard people use the word holy with about anything imaginable. Holy cow, holy blank, right? They're taking the name of God and then they're associating it with something on earth. And I think that's demeaning to the Lord. The other thing that is possible, let's look at Matthew 26. So there's this idea of taking things that are important to God or God's name and bringing them low, associating them with earthly things, demeaning their significance. And in Matthew 26, 65, the Lord is being interrogated. Start verse 63, but Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you say. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. No worries. Okay, so why the projector is powering back up? So um, the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. So one form of blasphemy is taking something that's important to God, like the temple, and the altar, and making it common, uh, demeaning its meaning. Another form of blasphemy, and this is what the Pharisees were saying the Lord had committed, the priests and so forth, is that here's a man and now he's elevated himself and made himself God. So that's the two kinds of blasphemy. Uh, taking what is important to God, his name, the things that he says is holy, and, and diminishing that, or taking something that's earthly and bringing it up to holy status. Uh, he deserves to die. He's claimed to be equal with God. Okay? The thing is profane. Profane. He's, he's profane. He's profane. Yeah, it's the same attitude, demeaning it, degrading it. Yeah. So that's watch if, if you're one of those people that, I, I've heard this several times even, not here, but this week, where somebody's taking the name of God holy and associated with something earthly, bringing his name down low. The psalmist writes, remember this, that the enemy hath reproach of Lord, and that foolish people have blasphemed thy name. We don't want to be uh, aligning with foolish people. Uh, we're children of the Lord. We should know better. We know what his name means. We know what our, how important our relationship is. We know who he is, the exalted God of the universe, the creator of all. And so we don't want to be foolish people that are uh, just needlessly and nonchalantly degrading uh, the Lord's name. So does terminology matter? Is a lack of reverence for God shown through wrong terminology? Uh, Billy Graham's brother-in-law, Leighton Ford, said this, uh, our whole vocabulary of church activity will change if we really begin to take seriously the New Testament pattern. And that's what I want to think with you about, is taking, uh, I wouldn't normally even tackle a subject like this, but in a 
in a, a study like we have, digging deeper, we're looking for the, the harder things, the deeper things, right? We want to be refined, and I think this is an important topic for us to consider. Irreverence of God's name and the use of wrong expressions will reveal ignorance. Ignorance leads to unbiblical doctrines and practices and times. Sometimes it starts with a little thing, a little trickle, but over time it grows and becomes something of uh, a serious nature. And we don't want to exalt ourselves or disdain the Lord through wrong speech. So let's uh, think about the Lord's name. Jesus is the, uh, the, the Greek name for Jesus, his proper name. It's drawn from uh, the Hebrew compound words meaning Jehovah's salvation. And so that's what the Lord's name means. And it's interesting that if you look through the New Testament, you will find Jesus, Jesus, 983 times. 625 times that Jesus appears in the New Testament is found in the Gospels. Well, that makes sense. God's Son left heaven, he comes to the earth, born of a virgin, and he grew up, he learned to walk. Uh, we're, we see him as age of 12 in the temple, Luke's gospel uh, reveals that he's doing the father's business. He starts his ministry around 30 years of age. And when you saw him, uh, there was the man, Jesus, right? But as people start to understand who Jesus is, they start addressing him and revering him in a more appropriate way. At the first, he's just a man. He's named Jesus. We see that in uh, John Chapter 9 with the healing of the blind man. Well, there's a man named Jesus. He's the one who healed me. Then later he says, well, he must be a prophet. And then after he was excommunicated, the Lord seeks him out, reveals himself to him as the Son of God. He falls down and worships him. In other words, there's a growing understanding of who he is. And when the blind man learned who he was, there was only right one right thing to do. And that was to humble himself before the God of the universe and worship him. So um, it's, it's interesting uh, that the disciples, once they learned who he was, they never referred to him by his proper name again. They always called him master, rabbi, teacher, Lord. Um, the Pharisees called him Jesus, and Judas never called him Lord. But they called him, they gave him a title. Um, not just his, his personal name. So when we look at the Gospels, 625 times you'll find Jesus in the Gospels, only one time in the, all those, less than 1% of the times that Jesus occurs in the four Gospels, is there any title of exaltation? He's called Lord Jesus once after his resurrection in Luke 24. One time. And then he's called Jesus Christ five times in the Gospels. And by the way, I'm, this analysis is on, um, I'm looking at the majority uh, text on this. It's not the, um, the critical text. So let's take a look now at the epistles. In the epistles, now this is after the Lord Jesus is raised up. He seated the right hand of majesty on high as a name above every name. Uh, Hebrews 1 tells us he has a glory that he received. We have his moral glory, his sensual glory, but then he has this reward, this new glory, because he finished the work. And so when we look at the epistles, you'll find the Asus 290 times. 82 times we read Jesus Christ only. 78 times Lord Jesus Christ. 55 times Christ Jesus. 20 times Lord Jesus. 7 times Jesus our Lord. Nine times, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Six times, Savior Jesus Christ. Twice, Christ Jesus, the Lord. And then also twice, Jesus is the Christ. And then Jesus is God and Jesus is the Lord once each. That's 263 times. Out of 290, that leaves 27 references left. Of those 27 references, the Asus, 10 are directly associated with the Father. In other words, he isn't receiving a title of exaltation, but because of his association with God the Father, he is being honored. Twice, there's association with the Holy Spirit. 
Seven times Christ is exalted in the same Greek sentence. In other words, in the English, it, does, it may not be the same verse, but it's in the same Greek sentence he's exalted. Uh, sometimes he may be called uh, Jesus, but uh, Lord Jesus in, in the same uh, text. And so he's exalted within the same thought. That leaves six miscellaneous references. Uh, preach another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11, 4. Speaking of Jesus' blood, uh, Hebrews 10, 9. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, Hebrews 12, 24. And, and that, by the way, is the discussion of this, this new heavenly city and who's going to be occupying it, right? Uh, the angels and Old Testament saints and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And then Hebrews 13, 12, the body of Jesus judged outside the gate. Uh, Hebrews 4, 8 refers to Joshua, not Jesus. And then we have a reference in Revelation 17, 6, martyrs of Jesus. <coughs> All this to say that in the majority text, it isn't quite as good in the uh, critical text, but in the majority text, it's nearly a clean sweep. Um, Any time that the apostles refer to Jesus in the epistles, except for those six miscellaneous references, they were very careful not just to refer to him by his proper name, but give him his full due. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Christ the Lord. Um, when you think about uh, the difference, a lot of people know who Jesus is. I hear people say, Jesus Christ. You ever hear that? that that's blaspheming the name of the Lord. That's not a worshiping him. But how many times have you ever heard somebody say, the Lord Jesus Christ in contempt? I've never heard it. Jesus is the man. That's how he's referred to in the Gospels. He is the Christ. He is the Redeemer. He's the one who sacrificed himself for us. But that's not the end of the message. He is raised up, highly exalted. He's alive, which means he's Lord. And so when we say the Lord Jesus Christ, even in our conversations and so forth, and again, I don't want to be legalistic about that. I'm just saying that when we give him his full due, it's the gospel message. He's the man that came from heaven, he's the Christ, and he's raised from the dead, he's alive, and he's the one in authority. Okay, So it it calls our attention beyond what the world would say. They use the name of Jesus flippantly, um, Jesus Christ often in slander. But when you start talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, it's... um, it really exalts him. It's saying it's a it's a gospel message in only three words, and I, I really appreciate that. I think it was Mike that made this observation earlier. When Paul's talking to the church at Corinth, it's it's a church out of order. It's got all kinds of problems. It's got doctrinal problems. It's got carnality. Um, where does he start in trying to bring this? local assembly that's out of order back into order. If you read the first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, seven times Paul is going to hammer this home, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Kyrios is the the word translated uh, Lord. It's the highest concentration of Kyrios in all the New Testament, right there in those first opening verses of 1 Corinthians. What's the solution for a church that's in disunity? Uh, Having carnality, having false doctrine, get their eyes on the Lord, give him his proper due, make him the Lord of the assembly. When he has his proper position as the head, the other things start working themselves out. And so the Lord, uh, Paul is calling the attention to the the saints at Corinth to uh, put the Lord in his proper place. And I think in a lot of our assemblies that the Lord had his proper place. And we're constantly reminding each other the Lord's in his proper place. Just like the head coverings constantly reminding us of the glories of, of God, the uncovered head of the man. That's important to God. If we keep doing all these, these things that scripture gives us. We're going to make sure that we're consciously mindful of God's glory and his authority. And that we need these reminders. Sir Robert Anderson to Mercer Uh, mentioned uh, a few times this week, he says this, 
And the more we investigate it, the plainer will be the proof appear that while through the Gospels, the Lord is habitually called Jesus, the simple name is never used in the epistle, save <coughs> with some particular significance, either to doctrine or emphasis. T.S. Wilson wrote this, or he said this at a conference, later wrote it. My dear brother and sister, if you ever speak of him in prayer, and you are ever speaking about him in ministry of the word, and in the proclamation, proclamation of the gospel, give him his full rightful title. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, I think it's wrong to get legalistic in these things. The idea here is to let's be constantly mindful of who he is and not just have casual conversation that actually might be demeaning to the Lord. The Holy Spirit enables the human will to recognize Jesus as Lord. No man can say that Jesus is Lord, uh, but by the Holy Ghost or the Spirit. Second, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. So there's really uh, this dichotomy just even between Jesus Christ and Lord Jesus Christ. When we say Lord, that means he's alive and he's an authority. And I think the more often that we can convey that to people, that's important. And we need to hear that ourselves. Now, it's true that in Matthew 7, 21, there are people that will call Jesus Christ Lord, and obviously they're not saved. Uh, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. There are people that knew things about the Lord. There are people doing things in the Lord's name, but yet they didn't know the Lord. But nobody can freely express the Lord Jesus Christ and mean it without the Spirit of God enabling that, enabling that understanding. Adolf Hitler once declared, anyone who dares to lay hand on the highest image of the Lord commits sacrilege against the benevolent creator. And he did commit sacrilege against the benevolent creator. He might have referred to him as Lord, but he certainly wasn't Lord. All right, this is think of this quickly about idioms and euphemisms, and then we'll be done. Idioms are specialized jargon related to particular cultural people. You know, we might say he kicked the bucket express somebody passing away. Uh, a popular idiom today, which expresses surprise that someone some, or something bad has happened is, oh my God. I hear that all the time on the news, especially if there's been some disaster. This is what the, especially unregenerate will cry out, oh my God. It's not that they're crying to the God, uh, the creator for help. They're just expressing an idiom for surprise or shock. Sometimes we'll hear people say the man upstairs instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so sometimes we plug in idioms, which really aren't good reflections of who the Lord is. Or we express things that really aren't exalting to the Lord. Euphemisms, these are substitutes, less uh, offensive words that are substitute for more explicit terms. And I wrote down a number of these just so we can kind of uh, take inventory of our own vernacular. Uh, euphemisms for God, goodness, mercy, gracious, gosh, golly, sometimes compounded. Thank goodness, mercy me, my grandmother used to say that all the time, for gracious sakes. Um, we now say goodbye, but it used to be God be with you. And if you look it up in the dictionary, Goodbye, it'll say a euphemism for God be with you. That's what's changed. The Bible, we might say the good book, might say Lordy, Jesus, we might say G or G, G's. Uh, for Dan, darn, dang, dang it, darnation, there's a whole bunch of those. They really came out when the Hayes Code went out in 1968, governing the, the movies and, and what would be in them. Uh, from 1968 on, um, what had been covered by euphemisms and the less explicit became explicit. And that happened in 1968. So a lot of the TV program in the 50s and 60s, Gomer Pyle, The Beaver, even the cartoons uh, would use euphemisms and uh, to express less explicit things. And so we have Gomer Pyle, um, gee whiz. Or, um, golly, sorry, and Beaver was GE Wiz. Thank you. 
You have to be a certain age to remember that. <laughs> Goofy, gosh darn. Uh, and so that's why, especially in the 50s and 60s, there were a lot of euphemisms, not the explicits after the Hayes Code went out in 68, then the explicits came in. And that's when we really started seeing a lot of um, uh, this nastiness in the uh, movie industry. So rightfully using the Lord's name. Uh, in the Gospels, the Father introduces his son, Jesus Christ, to the world. This is God's preface to knowing Christ personally. He's the man Jesus. Acts demonstrates the outworking of the name of Jesus Christ. The epistles and revelations speak of those who know Christ as Savior. He is revered in speech and title. Again, from my analysis, all but six miscellaneous references, the apostles were very careful the way that they used the name of Jesus. They just didn't flippantly use it. They were the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus the Lord, and so forth. He, Christ, hath by inheritance attained a more excellent name than the angels we read in Hebrews 1.4. His position is as great as his name. And so we need to remind ourselves of that. He's on the throne. He is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. The disciples uh, called Jesus such names as Christ, Lord, Teacher. There's not an example of any of the disciples calling him just Jesus after they understood who he was. That's significant. And, and Judas never called him Lord, and he wasn't Lord to him. So um, another significant observation is no disciple of Christ has any title before his or her name in the New Testament. All titles are reserved for Christ. No elder such and such, uh, pastor such and such, deacon such and such. And the Spirit of God is so careful, it even says Luke the physician, Paul an apostle. I was talking to Randy Amos about this, and I said, you know, uh, bro, I'm, I'm becoming more convinced that in my writing, I'm not doing things quite right, because we always say the apostle Paul because it's easy to say. And Randy said, I've been under that conviction for a number of years. Um, no title before apostle's name. All titles are reserved for the Lord. So, again, I'm just doing a global analysis of Scripture to try to find the patterns that the apostles followed. Um, these are not strict commandments. They're patterns. I think it behooves us to follow these patterns, the example of the apostles who were being led by the Holy Spirit. So, in conclusion... God has revealed to us his character and person and his names. All of his names are holy and should be revered. We blaspheme God when we associate his name with common things, bringing him down, using it vainly, or bringing reproach upon it by associating it with unholy conduct. Another way to commit blasphemy is to take something that is earthly and low and exalt it and, and apply uh, a divine title to it. So terminology is important, as misapplied terms cause us to err from the truth in time, and the end result is to displace Christ with counterfeit religious facades. My allegiance and devotion is to Christ himself. Biblical reminders of him are second best, and the rest will tend to pull us away uh, from the best in time. Christ is the creator and the sustainer of all things. Let us remember to whom we have to do. So I know there'll probably be some discussion on this, and we'll take a little discussion, and then we'll close, close our time in prayer.